गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन जस्ट टू टेल यू योगेश डज नॉट हैव व्हाट्सएप या जस्ट टू इंट्रोड्यूस यू टू अ बेटर थिंग अबाउट योगेश इज प्रॉबली लिविंग अ मच मोर पीसफुल लाइफ देन मोस्ट ऑफ अस सो वी हैव एन एक्सट्रीमली एस्टीम ग्रुप ऑफ पीपल ओवर आई एम नॉट सेंग दिस बिकॉज आई एम ट्राइंग टू लुक फॉर क्लाइंट्स फ्रॉम हेयर आई एम जस्ट सेंग दिस बिकॉज आई सॉ द पैनल फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम एंड आई वॉज लाइक वू we have everything we have people who are building brands for skin care and cosmetics to people who are selling cars people who are giving you a new music experience people who are probably telling you how to drive a you know a sustainable automobile we have someone who's helping you manage finances over here almost everyone on this panel probably where, wherever you look around you at this point of time each one of these individuals in some way is affecting you and making you take decisions so probably they are the real influencers and then we are going to talk about um influencer marketing uh we have been um talk we have been looking at reels i'm sure some of you are probably doing that right now some of you are looking at stories which are shared as meme pages by your friends colleagues some of you are looking at youtube videos some of you are actually checking that hashtag out pit cmo and seeing who's posting the content we are living in an era of social media and at this point of time everyone who has made a place for themselves in social media can probably influence your life in some way or the other and that's the essence of influencer marketing obviously there's positives and negatives around it but uh, we all were discussing that somewhere in 2020 after the lockdown it even penetrated to an extent where people used to be irritated with us for using phones all the time like our parents and grandparents are now consuming more content than us are now on social media more than us so we are living in a era of social media and we are getting influenced on an everyday basis by influencers uh coming to the specific panel where we are talking about uh gen z influencers so before we start uh, the conversation and i hand over uh, you know the detailing to the panelists what is gen z like i would just like to define it um, for all of you like people who are born somewhere between this is like a very broad definition people who are born between the age of 19 between the years 1980 to 1997 98 are generally considered to be millennials these are people who probably were the first users of uh, internet and mobile phones and computers the generation after that that is 1997 98 to 2010 born during these years are considered to be gen z's these are people who were born with a mobile phone in their hand they saw their parents using it they probably used their first devices when they were in class 2 class 3 and they were they never heard the dial up internet in their lives and after that is something called gen alpha we we'll probably discuss about those guys 10 years later but today we'll talk about gen z so i have very specific questions now i'll i'll leave it to open uh, to my uh, panelists over here so one one thing which i which i really wanted to ask and which we we were discussing also what's what's your broad take on influencers we're not talking about gen z per se over here but uh, influencers across categories uh, what's your broad take on influencers and how do you think they help your brands how do they how do you think they help creating more awareness about what you're doing for your brands so um, i would like to start with uh, kirtana hi can everyone hear me all right so um to answer your question pratik content creators and influencers are of course incredibly important to all brands um talking specifically about our brand um i think they help us achieve our breadth and depth goals as far as awareness is concerned and for us our breadth goal is about making self care 82 east is a modern self care brand um with skin care being our inaugural category and our breath goal is therefore about making self care accessible to all and even to people who perhaps have not yet you know started on that self care journey or perhaps to people who are sitting on the fence about that notion of self care so i think the biggest uh you know from an awareness perspective the biggest help that influencers lend us is that reach 
to those communities to land that message that self-care is accessible to all. Secondly, I think they help us advance our own storytelling beyond our own marketing efforts uh, to their communities in newer ways and more meaningful ways that kind of resonate with those communities. Uh, the second thing from an awareness perspective is the depth goal. For us, it is about building those meaningful relationships with our consumers. And this is again where we find that influencers play a huge and pivotal role in helping us do that because they're able to dimensionalize our brand ethos and our product ethos in sometimes in expert ways, sometimes in better ways than we actually can land that message. Because uh, I'll give you an example. If you see, you know, nutrition, art, music, sport, uh, yoga, these are, these are all can be considered avenues of self-care. Now, we may not be experts in all of that, but using influencers or experts in these areas help us deliver that message in, in very meaningful ways to those communities, and therefore the community is able to resonate and accept that message in a more uh, authentic manner. So, in sum, I would just say that uh, for us, from an awareness perspective, um, influencers help us re give us that breadth or that reach and uh, go deep in by delivering that message or dimensionalizing that message. Hope that helps. Yeah. Uh, Self-care, so I can think about uh, fitness. Pallavi, what's your take on how have influencers helped you um, in this journey with uh, HRX? I mean, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm here to specifically speak about fitness, but uh, why start with fitness? Classically, all the brands which have been successful in historically are the ones which are able to resonate with a certain community type or can manage probably creation of a cult around them or kind of have a clarion call for a movement. So classically, the brands which go on to becoming successful are the ones which are able to draw flocks and flocks of people towards them, right? I think influencer marketing um, is, is, is become the core of every media mix, every marketing mix now, and it's essential. Because why spray and pray when you can go really deep into communities and have meaningful conversations like Kirtana said, which makes sense without any spillage, without any spillovers, right? These are the cohorts on which brands are built today. In fact, not just fitness, let's talk about the most new age brands. The process of brand building has reversed, I feel. We start thinking of a community type, we start arriving at a problem, then we find a solution and then we build a brand on it. Typically, I think that the trajectory which is taken by any marketer today is community, content, and then commerce. So it's becoming a very progressive kind of chain. And I think influencer marketing kind of does all of this very, very efficiently. Also, I feel vernacular, I mean, reaching out to the roots and looking at genres outside of your comfort area is a great way of communicating your Indianness, your, you know, the fact that you're a homegrown indigenous brand. All of this is attainable through influencer marketing. And unless you're an FMCG brand, which really needs that ATL, I guess, this is, this is the way to go about for most of the marketers today. FMCG. Jagish, please. Hi, good evening, everyone. See, if you, if you look at the uh, way this entire ecosystem has evolved, actually, you know, uh, just taking you back a bit in time, uh, there was a point in time when uh, for any kind of opinion, you always had that smart cousin or some uncle or auntie who you would go out uh, and seek uh, information. So whether it's buying a television set or a refrigerator or even uh, what do I do after class 10 or class 12. So you always had some key opinion leaders uh, within the family. Th what has happened is in this current age and time, um, probably because of families kind of becoming nuclear and stuff, uh, and the fact that we have started kind of uh, going to Google uh, for everything, uh, the focus on uh, having these experts in different domains has just started kind of propping up and we call them influencers, opinion leaders, or whatever term you would like to use with them. Uh, see, you're right, when you say that for a mass brand, uh, ETL suffices, but what is also happening is within FMCG, there are uh, offerings that are coming in which are slightly niche, or which are addressing uh, the premiumization for certain categories. And 
the cohorts for that are very very small and that's where you actually start using uh, influencers to talk about that product talk about the benefits of that product and uh, post covid i think the conversations on uh, health wellness uh, eating right uh, the entire millet story uh, or other things have started going in and where, where do you seek the information from there and even if you get information um, of the net you still need a point of view need a perspective in terms of what to do and that's where i think uh, the role of influencers has started kind of uh, becoming a far uh, far more uh, stronger way, even with fmcg uh, overall i think uh, he mentioned uh, uncles and aunties they still haven't stopped when it comes to giving educational uh, suggestions of what to do in future and where to invest so i will ask uh, anand as to how do you use uh, if there are any uncles and aunties who are really big on social media for banking sector uh thanks pradeep uh i'll start off with actually a few things okay uh one is uh as a disclaimer okay i do follow four or five different influences okay yeah so and this is more in terms of travel health fitness uh, food <clears throat> etc so uh and actually i'm an outlier on the lower side okay because canada data actually shows that okay, people follow almost 7.5 different influences yeah and 26% of urban india right now actually follow any influencer even one single and that's a fairly large number that we're really talking about they they follow they follow and that's fairly a large number that we are talking about urban india in the context of urban india so what's really happening is uh if you really look at okay the perspective of gen z and influencers what is important for them okay so across all these sectors and what do we really track also becomes really important okay because when we spoke about the even the banking sector okay or even in in general in from multiple sector perspective uh, it is about advocacy also okay influencer uh, where we are following the influencer and is there advocacy which is really also happening okay so when we really also think about metrics what do we really track okay from an awareness consideration preference to actually looking at uh, will they recommend okay and have they recommended okay a lot of times we speak about okay Are, are you recommending a particular brand? Okay, but are they really recommending? We see that quite a bit happening. Okay, because of the influencer community also coming in, uh, because there is lot of nuances as even Kirtana spoke about. Okay, which are important for uh, consumers, which they are getting through right now, and they are able to recommend in a far better way. Data is uh, always very insightful, and uh, I think uh, data also mentions that uh, we. we now probably have more than 10 million influencers globally that's what i read some time back it's 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 one of the largest employers in the world now and coming to that most of them are gen z influencers now comes now i will ask you a ridiculously difficult question i'll ask start with you yogesh uh what do you think uh, gen z really cares about very oh, specific oh. aspects what do you think considering that you're not using one of the tools which gen z is used the most i'm asking you this first so no pressure thank you uh good evening everyone i think uh what we cared for is what gen z is care for uh as far as as far as i am concerned or my brand is concerned uh because we are in the audio space uh anything that delivers clean smooth audio uh is what my consumers look for uh that's what we are trying to deliver to them uh, that's what we've been trying to do for the last 77 years we've not changed our signature sound uh, we've not gone with uh, the wave of extra bass high bass uh, we've not gone with that wave we've always delivered a certain level uh, and that's what we believe is good for your ears or for your home audio uh, so for me uh, and the way when we look at what we ask uh, people within that age bracket uh, that you mentioned uh, is predominantly what do you like to use a particular product for uh, that's what we ask uh, we try and understand that is there a difference between how we interacted with the products uh, versus how they interact with products yes there has been a difference the number of hours that people spend with tech products has increased that's who i feel 
uh, Gen Zs or that age bracket people do. Uh, we have seen that we used to use a certain format of music genre to keep us calm. Uh, like I, I used, I started listening when I was in college. I started listening to heavy metal, uh, then slowly moved to rock, alt rock, pop, and now even EDM works for me, and even AR Rahman works for me, right? So having I, said that, I think that, Rahman works for everyone. I think. Uh, but you'd be surprised that he he works even now for Gen Zs. Yes. So that's why I started saying that what worked for us works for them. If you can, if you can, re, if you want to relate to them, just re, first think of what you've gone through. Uh, we all feel that that age bracket people are uh, are focused on brandishing themselves or uh, going against the wave. Actually, they're not. We also did that. Uh, we, also, we also went against our parents' wishes. We also wanted to do things differently. Uh, at, at some point, uh, these uncles and aunties that uh, he mentioned about used to say that, but we used to put, right? And so even these kids grew up the same way. So I think it is, it is how you can relate to them, how you can get your brand to relate to them. Uh, and honestly, if you're truthful to them, they will buy it. Don't lie around your product. Don't, don't, say, don't say things which actually are harmful to people. Don't say those things. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, ROI is what matters. So be careful with what you say to this bunch. They are actually woke. They understand their exposure to the digital world is far bigger than what we had. Uh, I'm not too far away from that age bracket, but having said so, I still feel Gen that… Gen Z, right? <laughs> Talking about Gen Z. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Uh, but having, having said that, I still feel that, shit, ye merko karna chahiye tha us wakt. Nahi kiya. I, I want to add something. I don't know how many people in the room saw the Russell Peters gig recently. He spoke about Gen Z. He said, everything that you think is wrong with this generation is something that we millennials have done. Correct. We said, we don't want our children to work. They have gone lazy. They don't work. We said, we're going to make a breakthrough in technology and they're always sitting in random screens, maybe managing four screens at a time. I think it's absolutely valid and true. Whatever we think is going wrong is because of what we've kind of managed cracking. But in all seriousness, I think if you look at the logos, ethos, pathos part of things, Gen Z is very high on IQ, I feel probably not so high on EQ because they are really the cool, no sweat, unperturbed generation, I feel. They're, they're actually snatch drip everything that they say. You tell them to stay in office till 12 o'clock, they will turn around with a straight face saying, sorry, we can't do it. I will turn it in tomorrow and they will go home. They're not perturbed. They're you know, really cool. Neha was just complaining about working on weekends. <laughs> yeah. So we know that she is not Gen Z I for sure. I think real story, authenticity, inclusivity is what really kind of uh, gets them going. Uh, like Yogesh said, be authentic, give them a story to follow and be inclusive. Like they don't care the size, shape, whatever. They're really cool, I feel. Neha, do you, uh, I think all of, we, all of us feel that what we did, they are doing it. They're just doing it more socially. They're doing it up in your face. Um, do you think uh, that's what, I mean, my question was specifically about what do you think they really care about in terms of, not only in terms of brands, but in terms of their lifestyle, in terms of how, see, so one of the examples which Pallavi gave, now I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to work only till 6 p.m., I'll walk out. What do you think they really care about? Is it, is it living a fulfilling life? Is it uh, living just for social media? Or is it just living for a group of people they want to impress? I mean, you can obviously broaden it. I'm just giving you some. Sure. I think... Sorry, can you hear me? I think uh, Gen Z for them, I think authenticity, being real, I think is critical, right? They don't want any facade, they want the real thing. So, you know, when we work with influencers, in fact, that's one of the briefs we give. Just embed our product in what you do well. You know, we don't want this in your face, uh, you know, a, a salesy pitch, uh, you know, from your end, because that really resonates well with Gen Z. I think Gen Z today, is, besides authenticity, they also have, uh, you know, a lot of focus on some of the larger causes, you know, whether it's sustainability, climate change, you know, things like that. And that, that all 
makes it very a very deep conversation that you can have with them through the way you convey your brand message. Uh, you know, for example, uh, we we work a lot. I mean, we sell cars, SUVs, uh, and the decision making uh, really doesn't lie today just with the 35 plus. It actually a lot of the influence is coming from the Gen Z in each family, and we have examples where you know uh, the parents went to buy a certain product. And uh, then considering the whole narrative and the story, the Gen Z in the family actually changed that decision to buy something else, uh, you know, within our portfolio. So I think today Gen Z one uh, not only uh, you know follows some of these things deeply, they're also able to influence the larger family, and which is why even though our primary target audience is not Gen Z today uh, in the auto sector, they become a very important secondary audience for us because they are big influencers uh, to our primary audience, right? And uh, I mean, if you look at even the uh, World Economic Forum and some of these larger forums, you have the Gen Z actually out there putting, putting the messages out there. I mean, look at Greta, right? So, uh, and people are following that, even adults, even other generations. And so I think uh, it's really about meaning, it's really about value. Uh, and yes, I mean, back to Pallavi's point, they are very straightforward. Uh, you know, and, and again, you know, our generation possibly is not that straightforward, so it's interesting and it's very refreshing actually uh, for all of us to engage with uh, Gen Z, both as customers and as part of the team. So it's, it's interesting learning. So I think just, I'll just add one point to what Neha said right now. Okay, sustainability is absolutely critical and important, and we have seen that actually through multiple ways of the data also. Okay, that. Uh, in terms of even driving brand equity, okay, for Gen Z, okay, it's almost okay 1.8 to 2x more important than at an overall level. Uh, they plays a lot more important on what the brand is really doing from a sustainability perspective, okay, from climate change, multiple other aspects. So that's actually really important. It's not just sustainability, looking for the brand that they're actually looking for. You know, whenever I hear sustainability. Somehow, somehow, I always think of uh, electric vehicles. Pranesh, uh, what's your opinion? Because uh, as Neha said, uh, some of them influence their families to take decisions to you know, make the larger purchases. In your case, I'm sure your teams are dealing with Gen Zs on an everyday basis because most of, these, most of, the, most of the Gen Zs, their first bike would be at a very early age if I'm not mistaken. So what do you think um, Gen Zs are looking for when they come to specifically your brand? So uh, as you started this conversation, sorry, I have a very bad throat, so I must sound very different from what I am today. Uh, they're pretty much sure of what they uh, want from their life. Right? You, you, the question that you started with, what do they expect? Right? Today, at sitting here, probably I'm not sure what's going to be in the next 10 years, right? At least when we were all Gen Zs, even then we were not sure about what we were going to do. But today the Gen Zs are very sure what they want to achieve in their, in their career, right? And they, they follow the, that, that process, that path, very clear in their head what they want to choose. We didn't have the luxury, whether by force or by choice, we didn't have the luxury, right? The mentality is very different the way they've grown. Now, specifically to our category, before I come to the brand, uh, the category is an evolving category. Today, uh, the penetration of scooters is about 50% in the entire two-wheeler category, and within that is about 15% for EVs. So scooter category, 15% penetration is of EVs. They're very technologically evolved product. Now you can't sell a technologically ev evolved product to a parent straight away. Example say, if somebody is not technologically inclined, they don't see value of EV. How do you sell a person EV without the, when they don't see a value and you want to command a slight delta or a petrol scooter? You can't do that, right? So if I'm a technologically uh, ingrained brand, EV is of course a, a, a mode of transport which allows me to travel from point A to point B, but you need that kind of inclination. Who gets that inclination faster? The Gen Z, right? Is it easier for the, us to communicate? Yes, it is easier. But the challenge is, because it's an evolving category, and that's a, probably a, a, a curse for marketers, if something is really familiar, you need to sell it as differentiated. If it's something really differentiated, sell it as very familiar. Because you want to increase the adoption into the category, you don't want to scare them. Right? It's so easy, people don't know, okay, how do I charge this EV? It's just as good as plugging in a 
charger like you do for your mobile phone, but still people have doubts. How far can it travel? Uh, people talk about, oh, this EV uh, today uh, do not have sufficient range. Any regular day for a college student may not be more than 30, 40 kilometers at best. Scooters, single charge gives about 150 kilometers on a single charge, right? So the way we want to look at these category or the, the cohort of influencers, Gen Z influencers, this is very, very important because they are the people who are going to influence my next consumers tomorrow. They are also influencing people who are sitting within families, helping their parents to buy scooters today. Right? Today as a brand, we are trying to redefine how the scooters are made in India. We started this company, Aether Energy, about 10 years back, put the first part five years, but before we got the product in the market, we already had influencers coming for us, which is our own customers booked for us. That's a strong value. That's the understanding that they have. And that's how they're going to add value to the entire ecosystem. So it's actually, I want to just add, it's interesting to see influencers who have a large following within the Gen Z, the engagement on their channels is 40% more. Oh yeah, you should watch a Karim right? Miniati video. Yeah, so I'm just saying, I mean, it, it's not only working with Gen Zs, it's also working with influencers who have a large Gen Z following, so that you're able to kind of really build that engagement and get the ROI that you need. <clears throat> and for a, for a brand which is as evolving as ours, our category as evolving as ours, it's very important how we choose our influencers. Probably a lot of brands have flexibility to choose the influence they want to, but we can't do it. I think we should be very careful. It, it's as important as choosing a brand ambassador for your brand. Right? At every level, they need to rub off on the brand, whether it's awareness or the consideration. The way the category is today, we need to do a lot of work in the consideration for the category while we are build the awareness for the brand. So there's a lot of play for influence to play in our lives today. Okay, so when it comes to choosing influencers, um, Pallavi, this is specifically to you. Uh, when it came to uh, building communities, uh, looking at uh, fitness influencers. Today, HRX is probably associated with uh, everything from gym wear to probably if you're going for a run. Uh, what, what did your brand specifically do when it came to building communities? Because you specifically spoke about it as well. Um, personally, for one, I'm very proud of our own influencer strategy because I think it's a very well-rounded one and a very deeply integrated one. Um, it doesn't keep changing quarterly in terms of the, the you know, list of people who kind of resonate with the brand and stuff like that. Um, it started when we were contemplating during pandemic as to how do we kind of develop this into something more meaningful and all of us had a lot of time because we were just sitting at home. We worked on this uh, key opinion leader strategy inside out, saying what better way than converting all of us into key opinion leaders because who better than me to start with? And the rest of my team followed suit uh, because I know the business of fitness in and out. I have the numbers on my fingertips. I understand the categories. I understand what happens on the field. I'm a crossfitter. I do calisthenics, gymnastics. I run half marathons. I mean, I'm a super user of most of the other brands, ranging from you know the international ones to the local ones. So the team started putting a lot of focus on what should I be doing to become the key opinion leader. And pandemic was a great time where all of us sat down, I think, we penned several authored articles, we wrote blogs, we vlogged. And not just me, the thing continued following. There were ripple effects. We, the community started joining in. There were people, there were aspirants across millennial groups, across Gen Z groups. People saw that this was an authentic strategy because we didn't enable them to grow just in terms of follower count or their engagement rates. The focus were not only on the KPIs, but it was actually about elevating the people themselves. So a lot of people who started out early with us as our KOL program participants, they started featuring in our shoots. Their content started featuring on our page on a regular basis. So much so that some of those runners have actually grown on to becoming our pacers now. So they, they are the ones who are training the groups. Right now we have a marathon coming up on the 31st of March. It's led by our own community, our own runners. They are the ones who are the poster boys and girls of the entire campaign. So it's a very well-rounded, very well-integrated for us. It's like the kernel of the brand. We don't really do an outside-in strategy. It's an inside-out strategy. Everybody who's a part of the system comes to the office. The content is created there. They're used for campaigns, be it with Ritik, be it, with, you know, be it for the catalog shoot for Mintra, be it a new collection launch, be it a collab on revenue share basis. It's all done with the people, and people have grown, not just their followers and not their KPIs have changed, but technically people have grown into becoming quasi-athletes or trainers or nutritionists and whatever they wanted to pursue. 
So, I mean, I think we were really ahead of our time, and I, I, I think pat on the back to my entire team for pulling this off. So, it's one of the best ones because Nike Running Club fell through, Adidas Running Club fell through, but ours has seen the test that's, of the time. That's awesome. We're pretty much the one on the road now. You know, it's always nice to hear a brand talking about that they don't uh, really follow KPIs. When agencies like us hear this, it, it sounds very nice. <laughs> uh, by the way, Pallavi herself is an influencer. Somewhere in the middle, she said, indirectly, you can follow me on Instagram. Uh, so, well, one specific thing when it comes to Gen Z influencers are that they've, I, I, sh I shouldn't use the word sensitive, uh, but they are more, um, they have more empathy to certain things and that also results into adverse reactions sometimes. Uh, we all have heard of something called cancel culture. Uh, I'm sure as brands we have faced it sometime, one, one or the other time because of some reason, some fan club coming and saying, I do not like the founder of this company, some, someone coming and saying, delete this particular app. Uh, to you specifically, Jaikishan, when you, when you, have, when you uh, run a brand which sells everything from cookies, atta, to luxury uh, suites in some of the best hotels, uh, how much does a cancel culture uh, affect you know, all the products? Because it could happen to any one product and then it spirals out of control sometimes. It has happened in the past, it has happened to CEOs, founders, it has happened to companies. What do you think can, can be done to probably, uh, you know, not avoid it, but firefight it? So I, I'll tell you a very interesting thing. <clears throat> Since you mentioned about delete this app and other things, so uh, in my prior uh, role, I used to be with Snapdeal and we had Amir Khan as a brand ambassador. Oh, yeah. And uh, there was a statement where he said, you know, I, I fear for the safety of my wife and kids and I would prefer staying, going out of India or whatever. <coughs> There were factions uh, <laughs> of people who actually started downloading the Snapdeal app and giving it a one rating. Yeah, okay. The funny thing is, because the number of downloads started increasing for people to give a one rating, my ratings on Google store significantly went very high. So <laughs> that's on the uh, lighter side, but yeah. Um, in the current scheme of things, we do actually face a lot of uh, this cancel culture and other things because uh, being in the food business, uh, we have gone through everything. We have seen gluten in wheat. We have seen uh, uh, stuff coming in milk, chips, you, you name it and we have kind of gone through it. Uh, so the way to handle it is two ways. You know, one is, you know, uh, step one is to uh, first figure out the validity of the news and other things. And in case if it's just a malicious intent by somebody, then you, the entire effort is in terms of ensuring how do you mitigate the situation. And uh, <coughs> One, one simple thing that we have learned out there is uh, just engage with all your brand friends in the influence of fraternity and start engaging and talking about positive things about uh, the news. Thankfully, in the digital uh, space, the shelf life of any negative news is maximum it's just of probably the next hours. controversy. Yeah, it's just 72 hours here. Yeah. You have to just wait for three days and the news will go away. So you have to just wait, uh -huh. you have to just ensure that for the three days, the pain on your uh, back is kind of reduced. That's about it. See, and again, you know, today, uh, if you look at it, uh, the retention level of even uh, the Gen Z or whatever you talk about on any such news article is very minuscule. Things, you know, uh, a money wedding was like a few weeks back, we all have forgotten and moved ahead in life. Yeah? But the, for that specific period of time, waiting for July, some of us are. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of Instagram users are waiting for July. Everybody had seen and uh, kind of witnessed everything out there. So if you have to only survive for that period of three days, I think it's just a unless you're kind of having a genuine uh, issue with the product and it's kind of going really uh, viral uh, over and above that, then there are certain other remedial steps uh, in, uh, you know, which we kind of work with our PR agencies in terms of managing the crisis at that point of time. Okay, so influencers do play a role in curbing it down sometimes? The other side, showing yeah, they the do. other they side do. for the brand? They do. So for example, uh, I remember when the entire uh, controversy had uh, sprung on the gluten in Atta. Uh, so there were different set of opinion leaders that we partnered with. So at one end, we did reach out to some of our brand friends who, uh, who were also housewives and other things and they talked about benefits of gluten and other things. Then there were industry experts who talked about benefits of gluten. Uh, 
some of these stories were taken on digital, some of them were taken on, let's say, uh, the news channels and other things. Significant amount of write-ups started getting triggered uh, in uh, print and uh, uh, news platforms and other things, just to kind of give people the understanding. See, what tends to happen is one person will come and kind of uh, do that only, as you said. The problem is people do not want to go into the depth of it, but they just want to follow that uh, herd culture. And that's where you kind of want to kind of give uh, that learning to people, your boss, just don't follow the herd, understand why certain things are there and is it genuinely impacting you or not. Like, I, I'm sure like if you look in this food space, uh, there have been instances wherein there have been pesticides and beverages, there have been worms and chocolates, uh, there has been lead in noodles. We've all kind of seen those journeys and we've kind of come out of it. So at, at times the, uh, the tail is kind of significantly long. But in most of the cases, we end up uh, actually addressing it. And in fact, uh, one of the conversations that we were having uh, backstage also was in terms of this person talking about sugar and ketchups and how. They lost to change yeah. In, in fact, I want to just add, you know, sometimes more than influencers, at least for us, you know, the brand love is so high in case of the Thar and the Scorpio brands that we don't even have to step in. It's, it's a debate between customers and they resolve it and you have, you know, all the positives coming in from their end. So we don't even have to trigger anything to say how do we kind of... So we just watch sometimes because these two brands, I mean, the love is so much across, right? And it gets sorted on its own. So I think sometimes it's, it's also, you know, how you build your brand. And again, Scorpio has a legacy of 20 years, uh, right? And uh, pioneers in the SUV categories. So I'm just saying sometimes it just works well if you've established your brand so strongly and you have a large community. And I think some of us kind of mentioned the whole influencer space, especially for Gen Z, is a lot about also belonging to a certain community, belonging to a certain cause. And that becomes important to understand that and leverage the right influencers for your brands. Uh, Kirtana, I hope um, let's focus on your brand strategy. You specifically target millennials, uh, not Gen Zs. Uh, what has been your learning when it came to, you know, interacting with millennials, whether directly through your campaigns or using influencers specifically for millennials? And can we use the same strategies for Gen Zs in general, specifically to your brand? I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think what has really worked for, well for us uh, are three things. Uh, keeping it simple, being authentic, and doing things with intentionality. And uh, whatever I'm going to say is, uh, you know, perhaps a bit voiced uh, by Neha and Pallavi, but, um, you know, this is our brand experience. We are literally just about over a year. And so it's not like we have a long legacy like Neha's brand or Jay Kishan's brand. Um, but that said, I think uh, just to reiterate, uh, keeping it simple, being authentic, doing things with intentionality, whether it is a campaign that we put out there or whether it is our influencer program, uh, these three principles are very dear to us and we, we are guided by this. The second thing that we do is having authentic communications and partnerships. We don't believe on jumping onto trends or um, you know, templatizing content. And the third thing for us is having meaningful conversations about our brand ethos and about our products. And of course, always having an angle of self-care in them. So these are the three things that I would say has worked very well for us. Uh, and uh, specifically with influencers, just like Pallavi said, I think I'm incredibly proud of the organization and the team for putting together such a solid program and de bringing the, building the brand in such a uh, you know, fast pace. Uh, the moment I walked in, there were several people who've heard of my brand, who've heard of the campaigns that we've done, uh, who've heard of our products, tried our products. I was in the ladies' room when, uh, you know, a young girl came and told me how fabulous our products are. You know, it's literally a pat on the back for the team and for all of us, because in one year, if we have been able to establish that, that is thanks to not only what we have done, but also what the influencers have been able to do. That said, moving on to your question of can those learnings be, you know, uh, served for the Gen Z cohort? 
I want to clarify that, of course, we too serve the Gen Z cohort. It's not like self-care is alien to them. If anything, self-care is even more prevalent amongst that uh, community. You spoke about that community, you know, saying that, oh, it's 6 p.m. and I want to leave. It's because there is an angle of self-care. They perhaps have another avenue. Uh, they're perhaps uh, taking out their bike and going for a ride or whatever it is, right? So with the Gen Z cohort, they're very authentic, they're very honest, they're not afraid to ask questions. Sometimes they even show you the mirror, right? And like Neha mentioned, they're extremely socially responsible. Let's not forget that this is a generation that has seen, you know, literally very, very powerful transformative events that have happened in the world, be it the pandemic or be it the digital revolution, right? And so for them, it's all about keeping it real, keeping it relatable. And so I would say that as a brand, if you have the humility to listen to them and to respond to their feedback and be authentic in your communications, you're going to be a winner. I think it's interesting also that the Gen Z has a rub off on all other generations as well. You know, so while we might say we are targeting Gen Z, I think, uh, you know, and we target other generations, it's important that we make a dent with Gen Z because that definitely has a rub off. You know, today parents, not just in, in terms of buying a product, but across, right, you're learn. it's like reverse mentoring, right? A lot of us, even as parents or even as managers, are actually learning from the Gen Z. So, I mean, if, if I really look at it, that reverse mentoring works even the way today Gen Z influencers are working. You know, finally, Kirtana mentioned that they want to take their bike out for a ride. Where will they go? They will be stuck in traffic. Am I right? We were discussing traffic before we got here. Uh, we, you, you sp uh, spoke about, uh, you know, they're informed. I think Gen Z is the most informed, we all agree, because of the kind of digital revolution. They probably see someone, um, picking up a specific type of exercise in the US and they're, they're, they're probably doing it the next hour. They're like, this works for me. Uh, and uh, Pranesh, you mentioned, uh, you have a very evolving industry. How do you strategize for, some, for, a, for, a, for a group of people who are so well informed and they are also constantly evolving? They're evolving in terms of what they want uh, they're evolving in terms of the new information which comes in and then they conclude something out of it. Sometimes the conclusion goes one way, sometimes the conclusion goes the other way. So how do you, as an evolving industry, plan or strategize a long-term strategy or a short-term strategy? What, what works for you? Uh, two things for us. One is the experience, which we spoke about earlier. I think uh, everybody understands that experience is the key, not just for uh, Gen Z, but across all our consumer segments, if you want to keep them loyal for a long time or if you have a stickiness for your brand. Uh, experience is one thing. Second thing is the technology. Right? Today, if you look at our category, our brand, today, we define, we are, we are actually defining a lot of standards, not just for India, but also for the world, EV. EV two-wheelers in India is long, long way compared to US, China, Japan, anywhere you take, right? That's all happening in India because we have focused on technology along with what experience that we need to build into our scooters today. But specifically about these uh, millennials, or Gen Z, sorry, uh, because they're all used to technology, they never had, a, specific to my brand, they never had the exposure of what a technology could, could be built into a two-wheeler, right? At the best, what they saw, which is probably functional is you see a speedometer which is digital speedometer at best probably in cars you had some screens which which show today the scooters can do all the stuff of a probably an evolved car today except for the shell of a car our scooters have a world's only scooter with google maps on 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 the dashboard touch screen on the dashboards uh, that how you ride that is relayed back to you right how do you take out mental tension of your place? Example, say Bluetooth, right? That can be given to not just from your phone to your uh, earphones, but also to the dashboard. How can you control uh, your music through your uh, controls on the handlebars? Where do you locate those charges? Everything is in the app. So we're trying to integrate experience and technology, which are making 
the lives of our consumers better. At the end of the day, what are consumers expecting or Gen Z is expecting? Give me something which adds value to life. They don't need us, actually we need them, right? Uh, so they, all they're telling us, if you want to be relevant, make my life easier, make me uh, be relevant to what I do today. They all have their personal goals, career, ambitions to build their own businesses, wealth creation. Uh, if I think in India, that's where they, they're largely different from Gen Z's anywhere in the world is they're focused on personal development, right? If they're focused towards the larger goals of the life, how can we make the regular things in the life much easier for them? That's experience, that's technology, and how we, how we going to make that re in reality for these Gen Z's are something really uh, valuable for us. Neha, Neha, we spoke about, uh, you know, the purchasing power uh, in terms of uh, the Gen Z's influencing, um, you know, families and taking a decision, taking a call. Uh, as a representative of the automobile industry, what do you think uh, should be the going ahead strategy in terms of, uh, say, maybe, maybe next five to seven years? What do you think the whole industry should do? Because individuals will then start also taking decisions. Uh, Gen Zs will start taking individual decisions of buying things. And uh, most of them, if you go and listen to the online conversation, talk about certain things like a ride-sharing app is more convenient. Uh, traveling from point A to point B in public transport is convenient, although that, that changes as you age. But uh, what do you think uh, the automa automobile in the industry should do uh, in the next few years? I'll address it in two parts. I think the first one is not just for automobile, but I think for all industries. I think, you know, a lot of us do business for business. I think we have to focus deliberately on business for good. And I think that message will resonate a lot better with the Gen Zs, even as they kind of move into the next generation, right? Uh, and you have to set the foundation now. So when we talked about, you know, causes that they are linked to in sustainability, what are you doing on ground as a brand to really make it real and make it authentic? I think that's going to be critical. And they have to see businesses doing business for good. So I, I would say that was, that's one part. I think the other part, uh, you know, is today we are not just looking at auto influencers. You know, most people would think, uh, you know, automotive would look at auto influencers. But we've gone far beyond, you know, today your vehicle, you spend a lot of time on the road in your vehicle. So the vehicle and in the years to come with electric and possibly even more, right, it's going to be a gadget. Your vehicle is going to be a gadget. So your tech influencers, your lifestyle influencers are going to become even more critical. Uh, you know, and auto obviously remains, but how are you building on top of that? And Gen Z, whether today or tomorrow when they move into the next generation, technology is going to hold a critical, critical part on how they make their decisions. And so how do we start engaging with, uh, you know, the Gen Z influencers today to assure them that we are on the path of next, next gen technology? We are on the path on business for good. I think those are going to be two critical, uh, you know, focus areas for us to take forward. Sorry, just to yeah, add, I think uh, it, it's becoming a vanity metrics kind of stuff that a company needs to be sustainable, responsible. Uh, that's, that's good for keeping uh, the Gen Z's engaged towards your brand. But if you honestly ask me whether it does rise revenue, no. Right? But it just keeps me in the good faith of what we do as a brand, whether we are thinking long term, uh, if you call us humankind, that's what people are looking towards. And unless I'm disturbing on those parts, I think they are with us. But if you expect them to, that if that narrative is going to drive revenue, honestly not. So we spoke about uh, purchasing power, Anand. Uh, what do you think? So we have been, I, I'm sure the audience has also seen a lot of financial influencers talk about um, you should have two sources of income, you should retire at 45. I think most of us are not far from retirement. Here, so uh, you should uh, you should invest in particular places. You should invest in stocks. Although the broking industry and uh, the crypto industry, to some extent, was able to attract Gen Zs to invest. But what about traditional banking products? Do you see there's a reluct uh, reluctance on the part of Gen Z? Because I have heard this many times from people way younger than me, my colleagues, etc. We don't have savings at the end of the month. We do not. We do not plan for the future. You live for the moment. What do you think the banking sector needs to do to attract these people and make them a little more conscious about money as well, like wealth as well? 
it's fairly compl it's fairly complicated actually for them okay because we spoke about millennials and we spoke about gen z okay we have seen actually that uh, compared to millennials okay gen z actually uh, stress a lot more about handling day to day finances okay and investing okay yeah and that's also coming from the fact that okay it is a lot more complicated and you spoke about broking okay what really worked in the broking scenario and let me just take brand names like grow upstock etc in attracting new consumers was simplifying it as much as possible for them okay and the simplification didn't really happen from just mainstream advertising but if you see okay even a brand like upstocks actually did a lot of influencer marketing okay with multiple influencers in simplifying the terms and the terminologies for them yeah uh, that helped because you are attracting a lot of new customers in a category where penetration is low. And let me just take a parallel out here, like health insurance. We spoke about banking, health insurance, etc. Uh, I recently saw an ad, okay, for uh, one of the brands, okay, which spoke about, uh, and they had taken a young uh, celebrity, an upcoming celebrity, okay, where they spoke about sublimit on some assured will be restored. What does it really even mean for a Gen Z? It's extremely difficult for them to understand. Unless until you... I'm sure a lot, a lot of us in the audience also did not understand. <laughs> so that was in the mainline communication. So it becomes extremely difficult for them. Unless until okay, you simplify that through a lot of other means. Okay? And not just through, okay, uh, through ads, etc. Or through banners and performance marketing, etc. But through a lot more content being put out okay, for them to easily understand it. That's absolutely critical. So simplification, okay, which will lead to more... Uh, awareness as well as ownership. Uh, Yogesh, I saw you uh, checking your phone. <laughs> I was wondering what you're checking on the phone. <laughs> Spam calls. <laughs> so, uh, coming, uh, coming to you guys, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, very impressive influencer marketing on uh, your page. We saw Valentine's Day campaign. Uh, I'm sorry, I had to do some self-marketing. He mentioned Upstocks. We were one of the agencies who did the influencer marketing for them. Uh, so coming to you, uh, we saw a, va a Valentine's Day campaign, which I thought was, which my team thought was brilliant. Mm. And on a very regular basis, uh, you have been using uh, musicians who are really big on the digital space. Uh, mm. People who have learned music themselves uh, and have been, uh, you know, giving them really nice uh, sets of, of, the, of your best equipment. And they have been reviewing it really well. It has worked. What do you think has been your overall strategy in terms of attracting uh, Gen Zs? Has it worked with these specific people, like these specific campaigns I mentioned, or it is beyond influences? You're doing, you know, you're doing other things as well. And if you can summarize for all of us, wow, that's a task. <laughs> uh, so uh, we believe that when a musician makes music. Uh, when a musician makes music, uh, he is absolutely true to his, and he's passionate. He's he's delivering his best when he's putting out that music. If it if there are people that connect with that music, they will connect with the equipment that he uses to make that music. Uh, so, which is why we've we've had uh, mostly uh, very very senior musicians associated with us globally. Uh, starting from Quincy Jones in the US to A.R. Rahman in India to Martin Garrix in Europe. Uh, so, we are fortunately for our brand, uh, we work on both sides, which is the professional side as well as the consumer side. Uh, so, what the speakers that you see here are JBL uh, versus the speakers that people use at home are JBL versus people who watch movies in a PBR Inox is JBL. Uh, the Valentine's Day specific campaign that you spoke about is actually bringing that story out. Uh, we had a problem uh, initially when we said that, when we were celebrating our 75 years, uh, we actually questioned saying, do people actually care that you have 75 years of, uh, or you've been around for 75 years? Are you? Are you a heritage product or brand or are you talk, going to talk about legacy? So we chose legacy over heritage uh, and we, that is what we are trying to bring out with a Heart of Sound campaign. Uh, that's what we are actually trying to deliver as to what you hear in a cinema or what you hear at large concerts. Uh, 
and we were the first ones to build from when when movies started it started as silent movies there was an audio behind it uh, and james b lansing which is jbl uh, was the first guy to actually build a horn for movies that's what we are trying to bring out uh, in our heart of sound campaign and that we believe is something that will whether influences ride or ride this wave or not i think this message should influence our consumers to buy it uh, we use musicians purely for because they are like everyone here said they are we are they are authentic in what they put out uh, as their music uh, and we'd like to be authentic and true to what we what we believe in in our legacy of 77 years so uh, summary i don't know if i may do justice to that or not but i think one takeaway that i got from here is uh, the gen z age group believes in authenticity uh, if you're authentic with what you what your messaging is i think they will buy your product they don't believe in sales pitches oh they don't believe in sales pitches <laughs> thanks a lot thank I'm, you i'm glad everyone's nodding their head so <laughs> thank you thank you to job. the panelists uh, i hope to see you all again and yogesh the next time we meet i hope to see whatsapp and instagram on your phone that i doubt <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot thank you thank you guys